Hi everyone, this is Sofia Nabar. I'm from Qatar Computing Research Institute and I'm extremely happy to be among you guys here to talk about the future of mobility in cities. So the, the topics I will try to cover here include artificial intelligence, urban planning and urban computing and big trajectory data. So one of the questions that many people ask is why do we get interested in mobility? Now, if you follow the latest um, uh, report by the United Nations about world population, then you would see that there is actually a tendency for a very rapid urbanization, which means that more and more people are moving from rural areas to live in urban settlements. So for instance, according to the uh, official statistics, in 1950, only 30% of the world population was living in urban areas. However, in 2018, we were 55% people to live in urban areas. And the predictions are that by 2050, uh, no less than two thirds of the world population will be considered as urbaners. Now, this very rapid urbanization actually causes many problems, right? One of which is the limited access to resources. And now if we think of a city as a set of resources, having more people joining the city will definitely push the boundaries of uh, these limits. There are several kinds of stress that we could observe due to the rapid urbanization. Some of them are related to the social aspect of the city and life, and others are related to the economic aspect. And also these issues, I mean, especially the ones that are related to mobility, transportation, are kind of worldwide. So if someone actually tackles them, then the impact can be huge. So there are several mobility challenges that one can think of. Uh, so for instance, we know for sure that congestion has a huge impact, a huge negative impact on the economy. Like in Qatar in 2018, we estimated the impact of congestion to be 1.8 billion USD. And in the US, uh, this impact is around 87 billion USD. In Qatar, for instance, we observed that an average commuter spent 16 minutes more than uh, he or she should per day. Now, if you multiply the 16 minutes by the number of days in, in one year, and then you multiply by the number of people who live in Qatar, and if you know what is the average uh, uh, hourly wage in the country, you can very easily compute this number. The second major impact of mobility transportation in general is related to health and pollution and green gas emissions. So for instance, in the US, it was reported in 2018 that the share of transportation in greenhouse gas emissions is no less than 28%, which is huge and which has like a very uh, significant impact on life quality and on health of people. And finally, we have also issues related to accessibility. So by accessibility, we mean what is the average time it takes people in different areas or in different neighborhoods to access or to reach the different services they need in their daily lives, right? Including hospitals, schools, etc. Now, in the case of Qatar, where I lived for the last 10 years, we have had actually real issues with traffic, with mobility in the city. So back in 2011, Qatar won the bid for organizing the uh, 2022 FIFA World Cup. And since then, the country actually started a very ambitious project in building new uh, infrastructures, building new cities from the ground up, uh, building all the, you know, all the stadiums, the hotels to receive the fans, and building the metro, etc. Now, all these construction sites actually have had a huge impact on the way we navigate the city. So these kind of screenshots became daily. So every day we would receive some alerts about new changes, new deviations, new closures, and new road openings, and so on and so forth, which actually made it very difficult for people, for commuters, and for businesses to plan accordingly and uh, know in advance what kind of journey they would have. Now, because our institute is located in Qatar, we wanted actually to turn these challenges into opportunities. So we tried actually to come up with some research ideas and research projects that are related to traffic and congestion in general. And we ended up having like three uh, separate kind of silos. The first one is related to navigation, where the idea was to try to fix the map topology. You know, the map was changing every day due to the different constructions. And we wanted to see whether we could uh, keep up with uh, and then we wanted to see whether we could update this map in real time using data that we could collect from different sources. The second pillar was related to travel time estimation, and this was extremely important, not only for the uh, average user that we are, but also for businesses who need to know what is the time it would take their drivers to go from place A to place B. 
So we did also some research here and uh, that led to uh, publishing a couple of other papers in different journals and uh, prestigious venues. And finally, we worked on some urban and contact tracing studies where uh, we actually try to have the government and different public entities better understand the distribution of facilities in the city, but also coming up with uh, better planification for the future. So now let me dive a little bit into, let me now dive into the map making project, which has to do with fixing the topology of the road network. Now, one of the reasons we wanted to work on this is that Doha is considered as a fast growing city. And as such, the road network shape would change very frequently. The impact of this is that commercial maps became obsolete, like Google Maps would take more than six months to reflect a change in the road network. And you could see this in this uh, graphic that I put here. So road, the road network of Google Maps shows the existence of a roundabout. However, the satellite image shows that the roundabout actually is canceled and it was converted into a junction. It took Google Maps more than a year to figure out that there was a major change here before it is reflected in its map. We also tried to contact another vendor, TomTom, Tom, and from our discussion with them, they told us that sometimes it takes 18 months for them to update the map, especially in places where they don't have much business. And finally, there are maps like OpenStreetMap, which are completely relying on uh, crowdsourcing. So basically these maps are created and populated by people, by volunteers, and we have absolutely no control on when the updates are performed in them. However, having poor maps in a city has also like a very negative impact on the businesses, right? So think of an application like Uber or Kareem or in Algeria, it would be Yasir or Temtem. These applications cannot work correctly if they don't have access to an accurate map. So we thought that if we solve this problem, we might have a big uh, return on investment. And actually we figured out that many companies were planning actually to work on creating maps from scratch using their own data. And we also thought that there was a good opportunity here because now uh, data is available, right? So you have all these fleets of vehicles that are equipped with GPS devices that generate data every now and then. And we could also have access to satellite images that we could use to extract the shape of the road network. So, you know, from a research and development perspective, that was kind of an interesting project. So our first solution was to try to extract the road network from GPS data. And we came up with an algorithm that we called Harita. This algorithm has four steps. In the first step, what we do actually is to uh, densify the trajectories that are generated by different vehicles. Um, this is like an example of the input data. And uh, so that densification leads to the clustering of the different GPS points that are created by different trajectories, as you could see here. So different trajectories, we do clustering based on some sort of radius. And in the third step, we try to link the different clusters, you know, based on the trajectory data again, which uh, results in something similar to what you see in the screen. And this, we noticed that this process leads to the creation of some spurious uh, edges. Why? Because you might have two different trajectories that go by the same roundabout and generate points at different locations. So when you link the two locations, which correspond to the different clusters, you end up having redundant edges. So we added this fourth step, which is uh, actually a simple graph sparsification uh, technique, which checks the graph for edges that can be removed without uh, changing the uh, reachability or the mobility in the uh, graph network. Um, the second uh, project we conducted here was to see if we could use satellite images instead of GPS data in order to extract the shape of the road network. Now, why is this important? What we observed from our work with GPS data is that the distribution of GPS points is not uniform in the road network. So why you might have a lot of data generated in highways and motorways, like important roads, you might end up having a very, very little information or very little data in secondary and tertiary roads. And this is normal because you'd have less vehicles actually driving in those roads. Now, of course, we are not the first ones who try to do this from satellite images. However, all traditional uh, techniques we're doing what is called in computer vision as image segmentation. So the idea would be to take a satellite image, consider it pixel by pixel, and then try to do simple classification of the pixels into does this pixel belong to a road or not? 
The output of these techniques is just another image that has two colors, black and white. So white pixels are those who should belong to a road. However, as you know, we cannot do routing on an image, right? So we would need a couple of post-processing steps in order to extract the road network, which should be like a graph from these images. And those post-processing uh, techniques had a lot of noise. So in our case, we tried to train an end-to-end -end deep learning uh, model based on convolutional neural networks that would take as input an image and output a graph, right? And for that to happen, we came up with this iterative process in the CNN inference, where at each step, the input of the CNN is a part of the uh, satellite image and the graph network that is created so far. And then the output, so the CNN will output two things. The first thing is a decision on whether we should move or that we should stop. So moving means that at this location, at this location, like the blue dot, the CNN thinks that we could still create or add edges to the road network. If the CNN tells us to stop, that means that we reached a uh, dead end. The second thing that the CNN actually outputs is the direction uh, toward which we should be moving. So in this case, we just gave like four different directions and the CNN is saying as if you are at this particular point, you should be moving east with the probability of 0.9, which is very high. And uh, by doing that, so basically we create a new uh, uh, node in the graph and we create also an edge from the previous node to the newly created node. And now this actually would be the new input to the CNN with the new kind of image, which we will create around here. Finally, we try to combine these two solutions into one general framework that uses both GPS data and satellite images. And this is a demo uh, for an area in Qatar. What you see in blue is the road network that we are creating from GPS data. Uh, now, as you could see, this only covers the main roads in this area. Now what we do, we bring in the satellite image and we use road tracer algorithm to try to fill in the gaps and uh, figure out the road networks, the road uh, segments that are in these small residential areas. And this actually worked pretty, pretty well. The second big project I've been involved in with at QCRI is related to travel time estimation. So the main idea here is to try to figure out how long it would take for someone to go from a location A to a location B at time T. So time is extremely important because traffic patterns change throughout the day, right? So if someone wants to go from uh, al Jisant, for instance, to Dar al Baida, it might take them 40 minutes at 8 a.m. in the morning, but only 15 minutes at uh, 2 a.m. in the morning. Now, why is this important? If you think of the reasons why people get upset with the existing or commercial map services, uh, these are evolving around two main causes. The first one is that the map might not know the actual topology of the road network. And the second one is uh, that the map provides wrong predictions of the travel time. Think for instance about someone who wants to drive their kids to school. And let's say that school starts at 7.15 in the morning, which is the case in Doha. So if you don't have a reliable way to predict the time it takes you to go from A to B, from your home to school, then you might end up leaving home much earlier than you should, or you might end up arriving late at school. Now, if this is something that is not very important for an end user, like a father who wants to drive their kids to school, this might have a real impact on the different businesses, especially those who are acting in the area of taxi and, and, and bus for transportation, ride hailing and ride sharing, um, delivery companies and logistics. So these companies or these businesses need to understand exactly how long it takes for their drivers to move around the city, to go from A to B, to reach the customer, and then to drive the customer from A to B or to deliver a packet from location A to location B. Accurate ETAs means increased uh, efficiency for these businesses, saving money. Now we were extremely lucky in Qatar to collaborate with a national wide uh, taxi company called Karwa. And we realized that ETAs are used for various services they provide. And this is actually something that you could find in any other ride hailing, ride sharing or uh, taxi company. Like even in Algeria, I guess you see it, TemTem and other companies would uh, make use of the same services. So for instance, fare estimation is usually based on the distance, but also on the time that the driver uh, uh, would require to uh, move the user from a place A to place B. Now, if you don't have the right 
uh, estimation of the travel time before the travel takes place, you might end up making wrong estimations and showing wrong estimations to the user. The second one is the dispatching service. So let's say you are a user, you open your app and you want to request uh, a taxi to take you from a place A to a place B. It is important for the company to figure out what are the vehicles that are around you and how long it will take each of them to reach your location. And then maybe sort them in a decreased order and you know show this kind of information which tells you that the closest vehicle or the closest available driver to you is within five minutes driving distance. So this is kind of important. And finally, the third important service is the routing itself. So if you know the actual uh, travel time of different road segments, you can come up with very accurate and quickest uh, routes, uh, which can also increase your efficiency and decrease your losses. Um, so we thought that if we solve this problem for this national taxi company, then other companies that work in delivery like Rafir, which is similar to uh, Uber Eats or Snuno, which works in uh, uh, logistics, could also uh, make use of it. However, the question is, who are the other uh, players in this uh, space? So in terms of provider, everyone knows Google Maps, but they are not alone. There are like here maps, there are like uh, Mapbox also provides this kind of services. And consumers, of course, are all companies that work in the transportation. What we observe is that this business is extremely expensive. So for instance, Google Maps charges 10 USD for 1,000 ETA queries. And then a small company like Carwa, which has around 3,000 vehicles, makes no less than 1 million requests per week, which translates to at least 10,000 USD per week, and this is half million dollar uh, in a year. A big company like Didi, which is the Uber of China, makes 2 billion uh, ETA request per week, per day, sorry. So this is huge. So the money implications are, are huge. However, this is kind of interesting for us because then if you can show these companies that you can help them actually get service that is competitive with the existing solutions that, that might be cheaper, then you, know, you might have a, a good deal with them. So in our case and in our talks with Carwa, we agreed to try to help them reduce their uh, bill on the ETA request they were making to Google Maps. However, they wanted to make sure that we get comparable accuracy in terms of predictions. Uh, so our predictions should be as accurate as the Google ones. And then they wanted also to have the same response time. So when you start dealing with API calls, you wanna make sure that you can handle you know, a few thousand calls per, per second efficiently. And finally, they wanted the system to be as available uh, as, as Google Maps keys, right? So they don't want downtime and so on and so forth. Luckily, after a year and a half of work, we could actually come up with a system that I'm trying to demo here, which has the different components that any uh, uh, decent map engine should have. So we had a geocoder, we, which is able to translate uh, text data into lat longs. Uh, we had different algorithms for routing, and we could also learn different traffic patterns to come up with uh, accurate estimations of the duration. And actually, we could also show that our solution was 4% uh, more accurate than uh, Google uh, solution. However, in order to build the system, we needed three main ingredients. We needed a map. For this, we use OpenStreetMap, which is crowdsourced map. So for the routing engine, we started at the beginning by creating our own uh, uh, shortest path algorithms based on Dijkstra. However, because we wanted the system to be uh, efficient, scalable, and highly available, we turned into the OSRM open source project, which worked just very, very well. Finally, we were extremely lucky in this collaboration to get access to traffic data from our partner, Carwa, which helped us actually um, create machine learning models to learn the actual uh, traffic patterns. The first thing you'd like to do when you try to study travel time estimations is to understand the difference between free flow travels and in traffic travels. Now, if you use a free flow routing engine like OSRM and you try to plot the average travel time of all trips that happen at a particular hour of the day, here I have like 24 hours, you end up having a curve similar to the blue one here where regardless of the hour of the day, the average trip duration is around 21 minutes. However, when you take the actual duration of trips as they happen, you would see actually that there are some sort of patterns. So very early in the morning, between midnight and 4 a.m. in the morning, the two curves look similar, which is fine because there's no traffic in the roads. However, at around 5 a.m. in the morning, 
we see that the red curve actually starts going considerably or significantly up to reflect the actual morning commute time, right? The congestion that is induced by the uh, morning commute. Then between you know, 9 and 4 p.m., you have some sort of, you know, the traffic goes a little down, but then it goes up again for the evening commute. So when you deal with ETAs, basically what you try to do is to move this blue line to look closer to the red line. Now, our first solution, STAD, has a very simple intuition. So the idea is that if someone is driving from A to B in 14 minutes without traffic, and now if we know that this guy is departing at 6 p.m. on Thursday, which is usually extremely congested, and if we know that A is in the Pearl and then B is in the said area, which are also congested, then we should be able to train a machine learning model that would adjust these 14 minutes into 20 minutes. So it would add six minutes penalty just because we know the time, we know the temporal aspect of the trip, and we know also we have also some information about the special uh, aspect of the trip. So we ended up creating a very simple uh, supervised learning model where we try to predict the actual duration time here, like 23 minutes, 17 minutes, 21 minutes, these are actual trips. Let's say you take 1 million trips, and then for each trip, we request the free flow uh, duration which could be like 17 in this case, and then the actual distance of the route, 12.5 kilometers. And then you take into account the temporal aspect of the trip, like this trip departed at 8 a.m. in the morning of the second day of the week. And also you add some special kind of uh, parameters or features that are related to the departing zone and destination zone. So you would say, oh, you know what? This trip started from zone 14, which could be Bebel Wet, for instance, and ended up in zone uh, 53, which, should be, which could be Dal by Da. And you know you do this for the one million trips that you have that we collected from the uh, uh, taxi company, and you train a model that takes these parameters here in order to predict the actual duration. And this actually worked very really well. The second solution was to try to learn the weight or the traversal time of individual road segment in the road network. So for this, we devised another kind of machine learning technique where we would try to go from this graph that doesn't have any weight. So we would start with a graph in which we have intersections and then each arrow is nothing but a road segment. And we'll try to learn the uh, traversal time of each individual road segment. So this one takes three minutes, this one takes five minutes and so on and so forth. And then if someone wants to go from A to G, for instance, we would actually get the route first and then we would sum the travel time of the individual segments. For this, what we do, we kind of split the data, the trips data, depending on the starting time of each trip. And then we also create machine learning model based on regression in order to uh, learn those individual weights. The last part I'd like to cover in this talk is related to the different urban and spatial temporal studies that we conducted at QCRI and which actually helped the government in their different initiatives. So the first uh, initiative I'd like to mention here is our contact tracing application that we named Comtrace. Very early on into the pandemic, around March 2019, we actually created a system called Comtrace, which consumes some mobility data about users and produces different uh, views of this data on the map. So some of these were related to the spatial temporal risk assessment, which allows us actually to identify the uh, hotspots, you know, the contamination hotspots. And this is done by, you know, by analyzing the trajectory data of different patients and by crossing also or joining data of multiple patients. You could, for instance, find some restaurants that have been visited by uh, several uh, COVID-19 positive patients. We also have some heat maps that help us understand the places that have been visited by patients before they got tested positive. Finally, we had a system also that helps us trace the chain of transmissions. So let's say now that you have data of all the patients who have been tested positive in the last three weeks, and you'd like to know whether there were interactions among these patients that might have led to the contamination. So in the system, we will take all the data from all the patients, and then we will try to figure out all the contacts that happened among these patients. So contacts are usually defined by two parameters. The first one is the minimum distance between two patients, and then the state duration. So you would, for instance, consider that two people have been in contact if they were within five meters from each other for at least uh, five minutes. And then we'll take all those contacts and we will sort them by date. 
and then clicking on one of these dates, you could see actually where the contacts happen. Now, if you click on one of these markers, you would see exactly the identifications of the two patients who have met at this very particular location. We were extremely lucky to have worked this platform with the Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Public Health in Qatar. And this was something that was deployed in production in the first two months uh, of the pandemic. The second study I wanted to mention is related to this novel concept of 15 minute cities. So this is something that is driven by Carlos Moreno, who is like a very influential architect and uh, urban planner in France. He's the University of uh, Paris Sorbonne. And he came with this idea of 15 minute cities where everything that a resident needs should be reached within a quarter of an hour by foot or by bike. This is, if you think about it, like a revolutionary way to think of mobility. Indeed, a lot of people think that in order to improve the mobility, the state or the city needs to build more roads, more bridges, and have more transportation, more transit and transportation. However, according to Carlos Moreno, he thinks that a city or a neighborhood should be able to fulfill six different social functions. The first one has to do with living. So everyone should be able to live somewhere, but should be also able to work in the same neighborhood or at least within 15 minutes by foot or by bike. The neighborhood should also have supplying capabilities in terms of shops and libraries and so on and so forth. It should also guarantee the existence of caring facilities like hospitals and medical centers, learning facilities like schools, and finally, enjoying facilities like cultural venues, cinemas, and so on and so forth. So now think of a city where everyone can do all these things, things within 15 minutes. Try to imagine if our cities and our neighborhoods are designed to satisfy this amazing vision. This would have a great impact on the way we live in our cities and it will definitely improve the quality of life that we experience. So in our case, we wanted to try to help with this vision by using a data-driven approach. So what we did is that we collected a massive data about the road networks, which is the primary way people navigate their city nowadays. And this came from OpenStreetMap. And then we used population data to understand what is the distribution of people in different cities, how many people live in different blocks of the city. And this data is provided by NASA. And finally, we needed also to understand the spatial distribution of facilities in the city. Where are the hospitals? Where are the medical centers? Where are the schools? And so on and so forth. And we actually could use four square data, four square check-ins in order to extract the different facilities in different areas in different parts of the city. We tried to include three cities from the Middle East, which are Doha, Dubai, and Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and three cities in the United States of America, which are LA, New York City, and Boston. And we wanted to compare and try to understand how good are the facilities distributed in different cities around the world. So we thought that understanding facility distribution is important for urban planners and policy makers, as this reflects and relates to the design quality of the city and the well-being of citizens. In this graph, we show the average travel distance to different facilities in the six cities that we studied. So the red curves are showing the actual driving distances, and the blue ones are showing the optimal driving distances. Actually, what we did here is that we tried to estimate the average travel distance to each type of facility in the six cities of our study. And then we took those facilities and we tried to distribute them optimally. So the idea was that if a city had 10 hospitals, for instance, we would compute the average travel time that it would take every single person who lives in the city to reach the closest hospital to their neighborhood. And then we would take those six hospitals and then we try to distribute them in an optimal way such that we reduce the travel time just to see the discrepancy or the difference that exists between the actual distribution of hospitals and the optimal distribution. This gives us a very, very good indicator on how well is the city planned. And you could see that different cities perform differently for different types of facilities like schools, parks, fire stations, and hospitals. But we could also plot the special distribution of the blocks and neighborhoods that are underserved. In Doha, for instance, we found that these areas here in the Southwest 
And this area here in the southeast are underserved in terms of hospital access. And the same thing actually happened in Boston. These areas that are in dark green are places where people are overserved. So these guys drive less than the average guys in the city to reach their facilities. However, people who live toward the north would actually drive significantly longer distances to reach their facilities than other people in the city. This is extremely informative for decision makers in order to understand what are the areas that need improvement. Thank you very much.